Anyway, so we'll get started. Uh, thanks for coming. Hold on. I have really great that it's videotaping this. <laughs> First posterity. Um, my name is Judy Towers, and my background is I was a counterintelligence agent in the U.S. Army. I was active duty, did it for six years. I was trained. I did this during the Cold War, so I'm old, a gazillion years ago. Russia was our biggest um, threat. It's amazing they still are. Uh, no matter what you think, they still are. They are very good. Uh, after I got out of the Army, um, I didn't retire from the military. Oh, actually, let me back up. How many of you are willing to admit you were in the military? Prior? What branch? Air Force? Marine? Okay, the other two, that's okay. I appreciate your service, all of you. Uh, Army. <laughs> um, if you remember in the Army, <clears throat> we were given, I had to give them, called SAEDA briefings. And if you're as old as I am, that's what they're called. I think they're called TARP now. Uh, threat, terrorism, awareness, reporting, something, whatever. But when I was in, it was called subversion and espionage directed against the Army. And so my job as a counterintelligence agent was to help you be aware of the threat that was around you because you wore the uniform, because you had the, you know, everything on, and your name tag said U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, Marines. You were a target. And it was not personal. It was just because you represented the United States. And so, uh, you know, and, and moving on, we did things and we collected information. So, uh, I, I went out, I got out of the military, and who would have thought that into this day and age that we need counterintelligence in a business environment? Because the only places I was able to work with that background was DOD or um, the government or the military, right? So now I'm able to bring my counterintelligence background to the business environment, which is like a dream come true. And so now I, I, would, I have an IT background. I work my way. I, I'm not like a lot of people that were SIGINers in the military and then transitioned over to cyber when they got out. I, you know, I was a domain admin for a big company, FedEx. Uh, I'm so glad I'm not there when that happened last year. Um, they're still suffering with it. I talked to a friend of mine, and they're like, we're still dealing with not pet ya because uh, it came to the home office through the domain. But anyway, I gave away a secret. So, no, I didn't. It was a public. Um, but anyway, so I worked through that, and then I got exposed to fraud. And it was fraud where customers were having their identity stolen. And don't do this, but it's easy to do. Um, I can create an account with your identity and ship on it. You f <laughs> I'll still ship on it. FedEx doesn't care. UPS doesn't care until tonight when they batch the records. You didn't hear that. Um, they didn't do it at POC when we create the account. So my job, when I got exposed to the fraud, was to figure out where our processes had holes, where our, pro our, our systems had failures, where people could steal from us. And I loved that work. I loved doing that. Uh, well, I wasn't frauding it. I was, you know, hunting them down. And I was talking to people on the phone. I'm like, hey, why don't you show up? And we got, you know... Your, your package can't go to Australia overnight. It was a brake drum for a Mack truck being shipped overnight to Australia. Can you imagine the cost? He was doing it on an account that wasn't his. I was watching that account, and they called me, and they said, why aren't you shipping? And I said, there's something wrong with your shipping label, your air label. You need to show up to a FedEx location, if you would, and bring some ID. That'd be great, and we'll ship it. We don't, you know, not a problem. Three days later, I, every day I got a phone call from somebody different about the same shipment. And it was apparently like a mailbox, et cetera, was stealing your account numbers off your air bills. And they were using it instead of their account number. Anyway, I don't want to give you the story, how to do it. Um, but that's, I love that work. And um, in 2010, FedEx took a bomb out of Yemen. UPS took a bomb out of Yemen on the same day. It scared everybody in their pants off to realize we've got a bomb on the plane and we don't know who the customers are. So TSA said, oh, and to let you know, just to be scary, UPS, FedEx, and DHL, they put packages on civilian aircraft with people. We don't know who the customers are. You're an entity on the Internet. I stole your identity and used it, and I shipped on it, and you put your package on a plane with people. 
So that scared a lot of people. So they created a fraud department. I moved over to that, loved it. We were profiling the customers. We were making sure TSA requirements were met, da 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 And that's when everyone's like, well, you need to get a cert. So I was like, well, the only cert for fraud is a CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner. That's internal fraud accounting. I'm doing customer fraud, identity fraud. What is that? And that's when I discovered cyber. And I went and got a, master, a second master's degree in cybersecurity and computer forensics. And then now I'm a cyber threat intelligence analyst for a private company. And uh, this came out of me going to DerbyCon for two years. And I went to the social engineering village and listened to the pen testers talk. And I was like, wow. And this is the one that kind of uh, upset me a little bit. They were, the, it was an impromptu discussion. And um, the pen tester was like, yeah, I had to go to a bank. And we were supposed to get into the server. So instead of going to the bank, I went out to one of the branches. And I went there when they started and opened the business. And I watched all the employees walk in, and I picked out the one I was going to target. Because I was watching her. I was figuring out her profile. I was figuring out how her personality, right? He was dressed in probably a polo or a khaki, khaki pants, looked presentable. He walked in. She was a teller. How can I help you? I want to open an account. Will you help me? Sure, I'll help you. Let's go over here and sit down. I started sitting down. He goes, I need to, and if you just sat in here for the last guy, go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. Oh, yeah, it's right down the hall. When you come back, just come grab me and we'll finish up. Well, he walked out and there was an empty office right across from the bathroom. He went in there and sat down for the next hour and was typing away on their network. And nobody knew, nobody paid attention because at the, at the branches, the, apparently people come in from the home office and sit down and squat and do work. So she, everybody else thought he was just another worker. Nobody asked. Nobody could see an ID because he was sitting down. They didn't think to ask. So the bank manager walked over there about an hour after he'd been sitting there, and he's like, what are you doing? Who are you? And that's when they realized uh, they were being hacked or, you know, pen tested. Well, what upset me is the next day they fired the teller because she didn't do her job. Unfortunately, I walked away going, you didn't train her well enough to do her job. Why fire her for the reasons you hired her? She's customer focused. How can I help you? Have a nice day. How can I, what can I do for you? What do you need? I need to do, you did not train her to understand her personality was her weakness, especially when you have a pen tester or a nation state threat actor. So this, this is how this, and this is a, a really good movie. This came from uh, Bridges Spies. Uh, it's a true story. I've been on the bridge. It's between uh, Czechoslovakia and Germany, or it should be East and West Germany, or the old days. And this is where they would trade spies between the countries. So it's a real good movie. Um, I enjoyed watching it. And this is, and so, if, I wish there were James Bond when I was in the army. They weren't. Um, and, you know, Sean Connery, it would have been nice if I could have worked with him, but no, none of the, none of the gentlemen that I worked with or anybody that I had to target was any of those gentlemen. I, I want to, I, I, another, I'll show you later, I want a do-over of my military career. Things are really nice now. There's really cool tools. Um, literally, when I was in the Army, I got sent to the field. It was snowing. I had a manual typewriter. I got frostbite on the frost nip on the tip of my fingers because I was the lowest ranking person and I had to type the reports. And we didn't have and, and <laughs> never mind. In my military intelligence, it is an oxymoron. And then be counterintelligence. What do you think that is? Um, but well, after and I'll give you another scenario story that I learned at DerbyCon. But when I was driving back home, I came up and I was uh, all right. I, I was not driving when I saw this article, promise. But this is what I, this, read Ben Tomhav, I think that's how it, I'm not sure I pronounce his name, but I came across a blog that he wrote about behavioral infosec is what we should do instead of security awareness. 
because security awareness is a compliance thing that you're going to get an hour a year. And when you walk away and you go back to your computer screen, I am going to go back to my normal job. And I'm going to click on those email attachments. And I'm going to go to mom and pop's gardening center that installed ransomware on my corporate computer and cost us a million dollars to restore. And that's another story. And, but this is something that I, I highly, this is something I want to teach. This kind of motivated me to go. This is what we need to do. We need to change behavior, not just make you security aware. You need to understand your vulnerabilities at work. You as an individual, and I'll say this over and over and over, it is you by yourself that are facing the threat. Just because you work at ABC might be one reason why you got targeted. But when someone comes to talk to you, they're talking to you. And they looked at your social media, they looked at your Facebook, and they, you know, and I know all about you. I watched you walk into work, or I followed you into work, and I'm going to target you. How personal is that? Where's your business? Where's your manager back there going, get old boy, tell her no, tell her no, come on. No, you were alone. You were facing it alone. That's the, that's the biggest concern that we all have, is you are by yourself facing this. But businesses are not teaching you this. They're just giving you security awareness training. Don't click on the attachment. I'm not telling you to click on anything. I'm just going to talk to you. I'm not going to hit an IDS. I'm not going to you know run a scan on your network. I'm going to come talk to you. And if you talk to some of the pen testers, if you listen to them to talk. Oh, wait a minute. How many of you are pen testers? How many of you admit it? All right, let's see the little hands going up. Okay. It's a game, and they are determined to win. Am I right? You're going to win. And if you can't get through the network, I'm going to show up. And I'm going to be the fire guard. I'm going to be the janitorial staff. I'm going to be the pretty woman whose hands are so full that I don't know how to get into the elevator and hit the button. Can you do it because I can't get my badge out because it's stuck and you don't know all that? Oh, yeah, let me help you out. And you'll see some of these other, uh, I got some examples, some of these social engineers, the women are the greatest. I'm sorry, guys. And it's part of, I think it's part of our culture. We are courteous. We have manners. We are nice. And it is used against you. And, and just like, you know, Russia knows that too. And this is, I met Edward McCabe at DerbyCon. I love that statement. My zero days are your employees. He's a, he's a pen tester. So, you know, so how, how hard, you know, I don't have to know code. I don't have to write anything if I can exploit a person. I'm golden. I can get in. And this is one thing that I also think, this is my personal opinion. I was social engineered, you know, it's everyday thing. But when you fire me for that, I was espionaged or I was spied on or some, you know, somebody took a heavy tactic. If I'm going to get fired for a social engineering event, I'm going to call it espionage, what it is, because the trade craft that they are using is the same thing I was taught as a counterintelligence agent. So if you're going to fire people, I want you to use the right words for it, because I think social engineering is trying to minimize the impact and make it nice. That's my personal opinion. But that's what I think it is. I like that. Sophie Daniels. Follow her on Twitter. As you can tell, I was a journalist, a, a photographer, and a mom, and now I'm the, and she is a good social engineer, good pen tester. She's awesome. If you follow her, she talks about all the things that she's done, how she gets in. A lot of it is because she's a woman. <laughs> I can't get my badge. My hands are full. Can you help me? And yeah, yeah, everybody does. They let her in the elevator. What floor do you need to get off on? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. So she'll tell it all in Twitter. She's very nice about it. But the things that I have highlighted, lock picking, I was taught that. Safes, I was taught how to pick safes. Climbing over walls and fences, dumpster diving. I did all of that looking for secrets. I did all of that trying to find when people were dumping secret information in the trash. And they were. Secret written on the document. Going to war plans. They're literally, when the war went off, we went to a base. They were activated. 
They thought we were CIA. Yeah, I'm counterintelligence, but I wasn't CIA. I was CI, Army. But anyway, we showed up, and we were dumpster diving, and we found they're going to war plans in the trash. It said secret on it. Some people got in trouble. Uh, cool gadgets. You, I told you about the cool gadgets. I got frost nip on that one. And, and I pretended to be someone I wasn't. She's doing everything that I was trained to do as a counterintelligence agent. You are facing a very hard, proven skill sets at work. These are not new. These have been around forever, and that's why they're used. They still work. It's really good. But she's, she's a good one to follow on Twitter. She talks and you know gives up a lot of information that's kind of interesting. And this is something that Chris McHagney said. He's the human hacker. I think it's human, human hacker. But anyway, he does the social engineering language at DerbyCon. There is no patch for an untrained user or an, even an experienced security professional who forgets in the heat of the moment to follow what they've been taught. And I'm going to go over some scenarios of um, how you as an individual, uh, when we talk about espionage, what, what motivated people to do it how they got caught, um, but in the heat of the moment is going to come up and they will give up the secrets in the heat of the moment. Subversion has been around since the 14th century. I'm doing a little bit of um, you know, uh, definitions here, but this is because I love what happened with Kaspersky and the NSA employee that went home with secrets that he shouldn't have had and he had Kaspersky software installed and they were getting it too. How great was that? That was awesome. I'm stealing it and Russia is stealing it from me. Even better. I, and I, I think it's more subversive. You know, who would have thought? And Russia's like, we didn't know, we didn't know that we were collecting that information. Really? Really? Interesting. But I, 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 you know, the material that he took were hacking tools from NSA and Russia got them too. So it's kind of cute. I thought it was pretty good. Clandestine intelligence gathering. This is more for businesses. This is where um, the traditional, it's like you said, the traditional idea of espionage is they're targeting one another. And, I, and it's further down, Russia has a lot of um, espionage agents unemployed. When the uh, Soviet Union imploded, a lot of them didn't have work. So, because they, they were targeting countries and governments. So what they just said is, well, you got nothing to do, let's go target industry. Okay. So you are now, you and industry are facing these kind of targets. And they are trained, they are determined, and they succeed. They wouldn't keep doing it if it wasn't successful, right? But the Uber, I like this, I like this, uh, the statement here. We don't need to be following folks around in order to gain some competitive advantage. Remember Uber last year when they got, you know, it got in the news? We're better than that. To be crystal clear to the extent anyone is working on any kind of competitive intelligence project that involves surveillance of individuals. What does that sound like? It's fine. Cut it out. Stop it now. The head of their legal team said that and told them to do to do that after last year's little boo-boo. But it, that's kind of interesting that he cut it out. Stop doing the surveillance for competitive advantage. You remember what they? You guys know what they did? They sent employees to go become employees of a, of a competitor so they could learn the competitor's way of doing things. That's American on American. This wasn't you know nation state. This was American. <laughs> companies doing it to American. And my opinion is, this is my conspiracy theory, that if one is doing it, there's going to be another. There's probably a gazillion of them doing it, right? And But we're not calling it what it is. It's espionage, subversion, competitive advantage, business on business. That's what it is. I like this one. I had to bring it up. A Chinese-Canadian national the med robot i know this is small and if you you know look at it later the med robotics company creates body parts prosthesis and whatever 
And they had been approached repeatedly from China to, to, for them to merge together. And they were like, no, we don't want you to back our company. No, we don't want to do business with you. We don't want you to own us because they knew what they were going to do is take their plans and their architect and build it over there and make cheaper products in China. Well, this gentleman showed up one day at the corporate headquarters late in the afternoon and the president and the CEO of Med Robotics was walking out. He was one of the last ones to leave. Saw him in a conference room. He had three laptops open, you know, working or whatever. He hadn't, he hadn't been there very long, time-wise. He hadn't been in the room very long. So the president of the company walked in and he goes, excuse me, what can I do? How can I help you? And he goes, well, I'm here waiting for, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, the executive vice president that reported to the president. And he goes, well, he's not here. He's on vacation. Oh, well, I'm here to look for the CTO. He's out of the country. Oh, well, I'm here to see the CEO. Well, that's me, and I don't know who you are, and we don't have an appointment. That's when they, he called the police. He was there trying to hack their network to steal their, uh, their architect. Thought it was kind of cute, but down at the bottom, his lawyer's defense said he was struggling to accept the fact he was no longer brilliant. He had a head injury. That was his defense. Now, anybody remember the cartoon? Anybody that old? Bullwinkle? Yeah. But when, it, when, I, when I brought it up, I know there's a lot of words on here, but and after writing, after, I, don't, I don't want to brag, but after doing two master's degrees, I, have, I write a lot, so I feel like I need to write a lot instead of bullet points, so that's why it's like it is, But because I've had people go, you've got a lot of words on the screen. I'm like, well, that's what it is, but anyway. So you can read it, but what I was highlighting, the old proven trade craft is pretty much the same, and this is from a former GRU, GRU officer from Russia. That's what I, the biggest point is, is old proven trade craft still works. And what you're facing is the old proven trade craft. It's, it, and we'll go over some of the tactics. And this is something I wanted you to see too. This was kind of, when I was um, going through my counterintelligence training in the Army, they did not give us this, telling us where Russia thought, it, hey, you know, it's great that we knew what you were planning to do. So we could tell if you were joking, pulling our chain, or actually you're going to hit the button. And that, that way they said it stopped us from creating a lot of world events. Technically is what they're saying. It stopped us from creating a lot of world events because we knew what your true intent was by, because somebody shared classified information with us. Now I'm not saying that is the reason why you should, you know, do an Edward Snowden. Please don't. But that was kind of an interesting way. I'd never looked at it from another side of that aspect of it that maybe we have stopped World War II or three, or three, not two, three, because they know what we're doing because somebody shared. Now, don't make that your motivation to go share your secrets. Okay? So this is what I was, this is the foundation we're going to go into. Any, in, any act or influence that a person take an action that may not be in their best interest. That's social engineering definition, basically. But technically, I call it espionage and spying because you're using the same trade craft that I was taught as an agent to do the same in results. And this is what um, we what I taught people in the army. It was called mice. These are the motivations of why people do espionage. Some of it is money. Uh, the other is ideology, compromise. I call that sex. That's mostly what is used or blackmail later. And at ego. These are the main reasons why people commit <coughs> espionage. And these are some of the these traits are the things that are used against you. If I come up to you, I'm Russian, I want your secrets, I'm going to use one of these to coerce you to give me what I want. I'll do whatever it takes to do it. They're determined. Yeah, I don't think you realize just how much. And, and did you do it for love? I wanted, uh, if you weren't videotaping it, I'd have music. And it was a song. <laughs> I wanted music, but with the videotape, I can't do that. So this is, um, money is the main, one of the main motivators. And I bring this sample up, this Hall. He was a chief warrant officer. Roughly around the time that he got convicted was the time that I was doing another investigation on another warrant officer, that their whole career was to work in a skiff. Do you guys know what a skiff is? Right? 
His whole career, he was a signal officer. He dealt with it for 20 years, classified information. And all of a sudden, in his household goods was a cache of, and this is how old I am, three and a quarter floppies with secret written on it, and he didn't know how it got in his household goods from Germany to the U.S. Ha! Huh. His uh, gym bag was full of it, just full of discs. Every one of them said secret on it. NSA came and took it. They, they, you know, we found out what it was. They were secret communications that were done during Gulf Storm 1. Somehow or another, he didn't know how they got in his household goods shipped to the U.S. from Germany. He had a German wife who, didn't, who did not move with him to Fort Hood. That's where I was stationed when this happened. She stayed in Germany. My job as a counterintelligence agent was to find his connection to charge him with espionage. I have to find where you handed it off to a another entity, nation, state entity, friend or foe. The law does not say they have to be a friend to you to you not to be charged with espionage. If I give it to Israel, I've committed espionage. I give it to Canada, I committed espionage. I give it to Russia, I committed espionage. That is the rule of the law. It, d it does not matter what country I give it to if I give it to another country. But I, but my mandate as an agent, I had to almost have a picture of you handing it off. You put it underneath a table, I have to have a picture of you putting it underneath the table, then I have to have a picture of the other agent coming and taking it. Because where was that, where was that physical handoff? So I'm, you know, I'd be out in the woods. I wore camouflage. <laughs> I had BD, when I was in, we called them BDUs. They're ACUs now, I think that's what it is. They were BDUs when I was in. So, and when I became pregnant, I was a bush. When I wasn't pregnant, I was a tree. No, I'm just teasing. So, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, the, the Army didn't know how to make our uniforms. But uh, Chief Warner Sir Hall, he made $30,000 per secret that he gave away. That's pretty good money. And he had to explain away his, because uh, he started spinning it his uh, rank and his money in the military, because you don't get paid a whole lot, uh, couldn't account for his lavish lifestyle, so he had a, an aunt that left him money. And he got sentenced to 40 years in prison. He's now out. He, got, he served 25. And we, no one really talks about him much anymore, because he's trying to you know, make a life for himself. This is my favorite. <sighs> John Walker, some of you have been around in the military. He was Navy. He did it. His, he has a couple of motivators, but his biggest one was money. Uh, he did it for 18 years. He recruited his son. His son joined the Navy. He started sealing secrets for him, too. He recruited his best friend. His friend gave it away, too. His daughter went into the Army. He tried to get her to do it. She turned him into the FBI. They didn't believe her. His wife turned him in three times to the FBI. And... Uh, they said his lavish spending was one of the indicators. As a, as a military member, if those of you remember being in, you're not paid a gazillion dollars, so any kind of lavish spending gets immediate attention. And he was able to overcome all of that just because people weren't, people weren't paying attention. Who, you know, this is a coworker. He has an excuse for his behavior, so you ignore the rest of it. So maybe the target isn't you, it might be your coworker. So pay attention a little bit. I don't want you to be paranoid, but yeah, you do. Um, but yeah, and there's more reasons uh, that he uh, got blundered. But you can also thank him. He got convicted when President Reagan uh, was uh, over the country. And because of what he did for 18 years, uh, you now get the death penalty if you're charged with espionage. That's a possibility. And life in prison. Uh, he got life in prison. He died in prison a few years ago. Um, back in the late, early 90s, late 80s, he did a 60 Minutes interview. I was watching it. Um, and they asked him, you know, what would you do again? What would you do different? He goes, I wouldn't get caught. <laughs> so back to ego. Um, you know, I was like, wow, you have no remorse at all of what you did. And he did give away information that did get people killed. He gave away electronic information. Now, his excuse is, I gave it to Russia, and we weren't fighting with Russia. I couldn't help it that they shared it with Vietnam. That wasn't my fault. 
But we weren't in war with Russia when I gave it to them. That's not my fault they gave it to Vietnam. That was his excuse. You recognize these? Ideology. Frequently people who are on a treasonous path do not know they are on such a path until it's too late. Have, you know, have best intentions. I've had people try and talk me and tell me that these are great. They're, they're, you know, they were trying, they thought things were bad and they were just trying to make them better. I'm sorry. When I was an agent, I read you your rights. I made you sign a sworn statement. I gave you lawyers. Everything else, you committed a crime. That's why I was talking to you. I'm sorry that your ideology conflicted with the rule of law. Change the law. That's all I'm gonna, that's all, uh, you know. And here's my other favorite. I've done nothing wrong. Now, I want you guys to tell me, because I have my opinion and I could be biased, did he give his information to a foreign country? Do we have evidence of that? No? How, why not? He gave it the way he it through the Guardian and Okay. So my question is, are you talking about at this time? Are you talking about this time? Are you talking about when you were when it happened? Versus versus now? Put it this way, in um he's trying to keep from being arrested so he can come back to the US. So let's go let's do let's use today then. Okay. Would Would you think he committed espionage? Because we have evidence, then you think we have really good evidence that he gave at the time. True, that's that's probably true. Um, that's right. Yeah. Well, see, I, I'm with you on that. It depends on which law I got to charge you with. My mine was always the the espionage law, and if I have evidence of you giving it to another entity, another country, espionage is a charge I'm going to bring against you. Now, the guy that I was investigating that had you know had in his household goods, uh, even though he spent 25 years, he had over 20 years of protecting that information, he's. Uh, because I couldn't find the other half, and I had to find the other half, the charge got reduced to mishandling classified information because he's also was sending back Iraqi weapons through a diplomatic pouch. That gave him another Article 15, and the Army goes, you know what, we think you might want to retire. And so JAG, when I talked to JAG and I presented him with all my evidence, they were like, you don't have enough to go with espionage. I mean, I did a subject interview with him, it was the most frustrating thing I'd ever done because we were both in the military. He had a military lawyer that was Army, and the lawyer's like, don't answer that, don't answer that, don't answer I'm like, oh, you got to, you know, what I, I don't know why I'm even here asking. NSA was in the room on the other side watching. I thought it was the most hilarious thing that during a break, I walked into the room, you know, I'm like, I'm getting a headache, and the lawyer, lawyer swung open the door, his lawyer swung open the door. NSA was behind the door. He wanted to see who was in the room. And NSA didn't want anybody to know they were there. And so he was like, whoa, and I'm, you know, and that was, that was kind of the highlight because it was the most frustrating day of my whole life. Because I'm like, lawyer, you and I are both wearing the same uniform and you're telling him not to answer the questions. We're just trying to figure out what the hell he was doing with classified information in his household bags. But he kept, you know, he was doing the right thing. It was just the most frustrating thing I'd ever you know, I was like, we're all wearing the same BDUs. We're all swore the same allegiance here. But so he got an article. He got an Article 15 for what he did for you know mishandling so much classified information, and he got to be retired out of the military. But part of that's because um, the Iraqi weapons that was illegal too. You weren't allowed to send Iraqi weapons out of the country. <laughs> Come on, um, you know we're so mean. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, you were told when you were over there you weren't to send back any kind of Iraqi weapons back to the U.S. You weren't allowed to carry them. You were checked. He was putting them in a diplomatic pouch, which got no scans. He and a buddy of his worked that out. Anyway, side story. And this is another, you know, I'd play another music, you know, the spy who loved me, you know, James Bond. Coercion. This is my favorite because this is the one that um, works the most. And this is where the beautiful women come out. And I can tell you now, there is one. I've met her. She is beautiful. She is Russian. And she's working her way through the cyber community guys. I got a picture of her. I've met her. But I can't get the guys to turn her in. I love her. <laughs> she loves me. And we're going to build a life together. <laughs> yeah, honey, she just gave her pictures to your best friend. And those two friends talked, shared phones, like, oh, shit. Oops, excuse me. Uh, you know her, too? <laughs> and they knew her the same way. And um, now she's, you know, they do not be surprised. They, and they're, and she's good. And she is, and she admits she's Russian. My parents still live in Russia. Well, you know, wonder what makes you come over here and do what you do? See, in my opinion, for her to do what she's doing, they're putting pressure on her parents, threatening her parents to make her comply. She's not even 30. She might be 31 now. But she's gorgeous, beautiful. She speaks three or four different languages. She's a computer programmer. I just want to be, you know, I really like you cyber guys. Can you help me? I just want to get into the cyber community. I want to work for a bank. Can you help me? You know, and I love you. I'll have your kids. We'll make a life together. That's all the things she told him. And he loved her. And he cried. Breaks my heart when I see it. But these are... I, all right, I'll go over here. You guys recognize her? Ann Chapman? Remember a few years ago? She was part of 10 that we rounded up in our country and sent back to Russia. She's famous now in Russia. She has her own talk show. She's beautiful. She is your typical Russian spy. Beautiful, young, accomplished, smart. This was a World War II warning. This is how long it's been around. This isn't new. Be aware of women. All right, I'm not trying to say, I'm not saying we're wrong, women are bad, we're just good. <laughs> you know, we're just good. If you ever get a chance, go to the Spy Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. I loved it in there. I was like, oh, it was so much fun. Um, she's North Korean. That's what she looks like over here when they found her in South Korea. And these were famous women spies during World War II. Recognize her? I think Gable, isn't it? Garbo? Yeah, I was, see, I don't know. How old are you? No, I'm t <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, these were famous. These were on our side. I think they were all on our side. But I, I like this. <laughs> well behaved women seldom make history. <laughs> Were you asking a question? No, no, but you're saying that beautiful foreign women are, are doing this. Uh -huh. There's the domestic aspect of this as well. I mean, you know, it's, it's right. Which is probably a good question. I didn't include them in here. There's a movie that just came out, Red Sparrow. Yeah, uh, that's true. I, I don't know if it's a true story. I know the author who wrote it, he writes it based upon his experience of what he's experienced too, as in the in MI. And um, the show called The Americans. Have you guys watched that? I watched one episode and I could never watch it again because I felt so exposed. They were sharing secrets, things that I was taught never to talk about, issues they were talking about, and I'm like, I can't watch this. It, you're giving away things I was told to never talk about and you're showing it on TV we're letting everybody see it and I, 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 I couldn't watch it anymore that it 
bothered me. It didn't make me mad. It just made me feel exposed. And I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore, but quit talking about it. Quit doing it. And so anyway, honey pots. And I, I'll let you know, the girl that I've been watching, that's what she looks like. An amazing, long-legged, blonde hair, beautiful. That's the criteria that the Russians use. And I thought this was interesting because, you know, I've been targeting Russia, and I know I'm biased, and I don't mean to be, but this was interesting that um, Mossad, somebody was giving away their secrets. They enticed the man to go to Italy. Cindy, who was a Mossad agent, befriended him in Italy, and they took him away out of Italy back to Israel to talk to him, to talk to him. So it's not just Russia that's doing this. It's not just, you know, North Korea, China, Iran, Iraq, or whatever. We're all doing it, and um, even the U.S. Okay, this is Anne. I'll tell you this. When I was a counterintelligence agent, they did not make us dress like this. <laughs> Thank you. I never had to dress like this at work. You did. Isn't she beautiful? And this is, and she's, like I said, she is now a hero in Russia when they sent her back. She was part of 10. But this is the part that I like. The oldest trick in the book never stops working, and spy agencies continue to use seduction as an effective method of espionage. The honey trap. Okay, I know this is really small writing. I'm sorry. But Longtree, he was a Marine, huh, Marine, and um, he was a security guy in our American embassy in Moscow. And one day when he was riding home on the train, a chance encounter with a young woman struck up a relationship with her. And I don't know why, how to, why he thought he needed to share the schematics of the embassy in the U.S. that they were building with her, and he did. And once they built the embassy... And, you know, they had it built. They were building. He went to, he got reassigned. And if you're in the military, you're normally in place two years and you get reassigned. So he got reassigned to Austria. Apparently he had a change of conscience. And he called his boss and he told him, I shared the embassy plans with Russia. Um, the new American embassy, you might want to check it out. There were bugs in every single wall. We had to go build another embassy. They, didn't even, they walked away from it and had to build a new one because of what he did. He's serving life in prison. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you've ever been in the military, Leavenworth is not a place you want to spend prison time at. I have been to the jail, and I have watched, a, watched them with a pick making small rocks out of a big one. I swear to you, it was a big mound, and they were making gravel out of it. No, you were not, you know, that's the military. Do not commit your espionage if you're in the military. That's all I'm going to say. You're not going to be rehabilitated making gravel. That's not their goal. So if you're ever going to do your espionage act, make sure you're not associated with the military. You want to go to a nicer place. Or you can go get a sex change. I never did. No. I, I like this one. Um, this <laughs> Petraeus, I, what a name. He, he really didn't pe betray us. But if you, rec you guys remember this one? Okay. I'm going to, this is where I'm a little peeved. As an agent in the army, I never had somebody send me their abs. <laughs> I never had a, another agent share pictures like this with me. I want to do it over, and I want that to happen. But, you recognize her? She's first Lebanese in this country. She is an unofficial social liaison for MacDill Air Force Base in Florida, where all these big wig generals like to hang out. That's because these are, that's a command headquarters post. So there's a lot of upper echelon military people that are there. She hosts a lot of parties at her house, and they all come. Well, what is she and him were sharing thousands of explicit emails. They're all married. They're both married. All of them are married in this picture. Even 
sexy abs guy. He's the FBI agent. So, you know, these two hooked up. She knew that she sends emails, so she threatened her and said, leave my guy alone. Don't bother my guy. Well, she did it anonymously. She got paranoid and called her sexy ab FBI agent and said, I'm being threatened. Well, he turned it in, and that's when they found out these two were doing what they were doing. And he, you know, NATO commander at the time. Um, I just, I, I just, I, <laughs> yeah. But the one thing that's common, in my opinion, they're all married. What does that mean? Swingers? And they're all still married. As far as I'm aware, they're all still married after this came out. Swingers. That's what, I, I don't have that in uh, any evidence. I mentioned that to somebody, and they're like, what do you think that means, Judy? I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, swingers. I'm like, ah, ah, ah. You know, why would she get jealous? Why would she get jealous of her? She's email unless she's emailing him and she sees it. That's the only thing I can think of. Why would you threaten another woman? Leave my married man alone. <laughs> He's mine. Oh, you need to read up on her. She wants to ban the word mistress. That's her goal now. She like she doesn't like that word. She wants it banned. Sorry, honey. Anyway. Ego. And, th and I know this is small print, but I'm wordy. John Walker, I told you about his ego. This in yellow was written by his Russian handler. We trained him right. We did what we were supposed to do right. He goofed it up. He got his ego, and he spent his money when we told him to quit. We told him to stop. He made his wife mad. She turned him in. Well, you know, dang it. And the Russian, you know, the Russian's like, we tried to do, try to make him a better agent. <laughs> he wasn't listening to us. Boy, he's got an ego. But his par their par uh, ego is their personalities won't listen to the warnings. Like I said, his, his Walker's um, excuse was, I will do better next time and not get caught. Yeah, I want to give you another chance. Robert Hansen, he's another one. He was... Um, he didn't feel like he was getting the recognition that he needed at the FBI. And so he did his, he gave away his information. There's another um, CI agent, and uh, I, someone said I had too many examples because there's so many out there to show about where people are giving away secrets. But these guys were getting people killed because they were turning in the Russian agents that were helping us. They were still in Russia, and Russia was then executing those agents. <clears throat> and they were feeling no remorse because they were, you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm getting what I want out of it, which is, you know, getting my ego stoked or whatever. He didn't do it more for money. He did it more because he was mad about uh, his FBI career wasn't working out the way he wanted it to. So I can prove to you I can be a good agent by being a turncoat. So he's in jail. And I bring this one up. And this is one of my conspiracy theories. This gentleman right here, your Aaron Banks, he's Russian, living in Britain. He used to be a gazillionaire. He lost his money, I guess, when the housing tank when we did. Um, and now he's got more gazillion dollars. And he's helping doing the BRICSX, funding it, trying to help them. He married her. She's Russian. She showed up in Britain, married a man twice her age, we're not working out after three months. So she went to this uh, British uh, politician to get an annulment. He, gave, he does a lot of this for foreign women, and he also takes them to secret meetings. He likes their company. And so he helped her get a divorce. But at the same time, she got her, her British citizenship, because that's what she wanted. She's Russian. She went to Britain to get her citizenship, so she married, just like you would do over here, married a British citizen. It didn't work out. So she needed a quick divorce. He gave it to her for small favors. She now is married to him. He's got gazillions of dollars. Like I said, he's now funding the BRICS Acts, helping Britain with their political issues. Um, 
But, uh, and this was, this, I want you to remember this. They're all the same long, these are talking about women, not men. <laughs> They're long legged, good looking blondes, never older than 25. They're fluent in these languages with a higher education. I, that's, that fits this young woman. Uh, unfortunately, she must be getting too old because she's close to 30 now. But she hasn't married any of the guys yet. But I love you. We'll have a life together. Help me get a job at a bank. I want to learn how to do cyber just like you. Show me what you're doing. So, oh, the story I was going to tell you, this is the one that um, kind of <sighs> me. It, uh, this is about sex. All right, All right never mind. You'll hear it in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Um, the pen test company was tasked to get the domain user's I, user ID and password to this particular company. They uh, scoped out the individual who had that, young man, and they noticed from his social media information that he either was recently married and his wife just became pregnant, or he, she just had the baby. So they were young. And the pen test company had a beautiful woman on the team that was a lesbian, and they asked her, would you be willing to coerce him and meet him in a hotel room in sexy lingerie? Sure, I'll do that. So she started working at the company, struck up a friendship with him, and it escalated to, hey, you meet me in a hotel room? Sure, he did, he would. So as she's walking to the hotel, <clears throat> of course, her boss, the pen test uh, project PM, He's taking pictures of her walking to the room. Then they just, and she walks into the room. She gets a sexy lingerie on. She's she sits in the doorway. You know, the door opens and there she is. So here comes a young man. They got pictures of him walking up to the hotel room. They got pictures of him opening the door with her at the sexy lingerie in the room. And so they've got that right. So I've got you with her in the room, and she's in her sexy clothes. So you know it's not a business meeting, right? So um, he walks into the room. She goes, I'm not going to do it, and leaves. Well, we don't need those pictures. We already got what we want. So they approached him and said, we want your user ID and password to the network. He said, no. So the next day, they sent him pictures of the hotel with her and him. We'll send these to your wife and your boss. Give us the user ID and password to the domain. He said, OK, I'll give it to you. Pin test over. Now, what, what skill did it take to hack that network? Where was the, you know, Metasploit? Where's the code that take? They won quickly. And that's what pen testers will do if, you know, I've, and I've heard them say it. I'm taking word from word from what they say. If I can't hack your network, I'm going to show up in person because I'm going to get in. You do have a vulnerability, and I will get in. And, it, and in my opinion, it's a game. And I will win. <laughs> so you're, am I right? Yeah. yeah. I will get in. <laughs> after, after World War II, East Germany had a lot of unemployed spies, men. So they sent them to West Germany to marry West German women. And they did. And that's how they were able to get more information. They were willing to do that. Another, at a, at, like at DerbyCon, another thing that um, uh, made me passionate about this is they were a panel of them were talking, and we were asking them ethical questions. How far would you go? Just how far would you go? And one young man, he goes, look at this. Nobody can say no to this. And I swing both ways. I was like, whoa. <laughs> You know, I wasn't, you know, when I was in the Army and I, and I went to my training, I was asked, will you lie? I said, no. Trustworthy. I got pulled out of the room, pulled into another room, and I had to do a sworn statement that I would be willing to lie to safeguard my country. Not once did they ask me if I'd go do the other stuff. But I did have to do a sworn, if I wanted to stay in my counterintelligence field, they were going to re, they were going to reclassify me if I wouldn't sign it. And I'm like, I thought you wanted to be trustworthy. If I'm lying, how can I be trustworthy? They're like, we need you to lie to safeguard our country. I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, 
yeah, I'll do that, then sign the sworn statement, write it that you'll do this, we'll let you continue in the class. Pen testers don't sign that, apparently. And the, when I talked to the, when he told me the story of this pen test, I was like, you blackmailed this young man. You, did you ruin his marriage too? Was that the goal of your pen test? No, I was trying to prove to the company that they didn't have any policies to support the employees when they were faced with this kind of dilemma, which was true. I've not read any policies at companies that will safeguard it if I'm blackmailed because of infidelity, you know? But it, I have to, I kind of applaud his efforts, but I'm like, ah! You know, I cringe on those efforts. They won the pen test. They got the password. He he was saying I was trying to prove you weren't. Yeah, I. I I walked away with a healthy respect going, oh my gosh, you guys are facing, all of us are facing a formidable task or a formidable foe. And it, and it might be your coworker. It, it, you know, they might, it won't be obvious that it's Russian. It could be your coworker. And you don't know. Just like, you know, um, Snowden, he was a coworker to somebody. They didn't pay any attention. I'm not blaming them, but I am, but I'm not blaming them, but, you know, but, uh, that's true. I don't want to make you paranoid. I want you to be a little more aware. I'm not trying to do more than security awareness. I'm trying to make you also, you know, be aware that it is you by yourself. When you are faced with this, your company is not going, come on, say no, say no. They're not back there. They don't know what's happening to you. They don't know when you walk away, you get on the train. They don't know who's approaching you. You've, you're done when you walk out the door. That's when they're following you. And your Facebook, <laughs> after we know what you know now, I, I've said this all along, I could probably get my um, birth certificate from China faster than I can get it from my county. And they, they know my family, they know my neighbors, they know my friends because I had a security clearance, they have that record now. Now with Equifax, they know how much I make, <sighs> you know. So per, uh, I've got, I got, a, I got issues. I think they're probably going to target Chinese nationals over here first that have access because their family members are still over there and they can put pressure on them. That is not above countries doing that. Russia does it. It's not above them doing that. Take a look. Read the statistics. <laughs> you guys see the monkey? Do you see the gorilla yet? No. <laughs> this is um, I, when I was in the army. When we ended this briefing, we always told them, if you suspect something like this happening to you, please come to your counterintelligence office, which would be us, and tell us. I don't do that work anymore. I'm not that person anymore. So the, what in the U.S. you're going to call the FBI. You know, just because somebody does this, please don't think that's what's happening. Pay attention. It could be just that it's an indicator of something going on. It doesn't necessarily mean you are being targeted, but just be aware Ugh. Be uh, behavioral, watch that, and um, try not to talk. I, I did put it on here. You might want to go find out if you have a pen test going on. <laughs> After what I heard, what some pen testers are willing to do, you might want to go find out. But I was told by a CISO, don't, do, uh, don't tell them to do that. Don't tell them to come and ask me that. It's like, all right, then they got nobody else to go to but your legal department, HR, or FBI. What do you want them to do? So this is kind of a dilemma, I think, for businesses to understand what they need to do. Um, it's a challenge. I don't have your answer. It's going to be each business's answer what they're going to do. They're legal, and HR would have to come up with that. But if you suspect something like that happening to you, call the FBI. And it could be something bigger going on. Anybody got any questions? Yes, Willard? Yeah. 
It, it, yeah. Russia, I, th I personally, I think China's uh, uh, R&D is to steal the secrets. It's faster and it's cheaper. And it works. Yeah. And everything else is highly damaging, even though they're only after intellectual property. And so I'm more worried about when they wake up and they start to realize what they have. Stuff. Yeah. Like a million five hundred NDAs or you know, yeah. all this stuff. You know, it's the, well, and, and that's why I think those that are stealing like Equifax, if they took that much information, it's not on a thumb drive. That's got to be in a database server. What kind of analytics are you going to run on that to, to get any kind of actionable intelligence out? That is not your script kitty down in, you know, on a thumb drive doing it. I, that's my opinion. That's my bias. Huh? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Well, J Israel, their friend, we had, a, we had a U.S. citizen that just served life in prison because he gave information to Israel. We just granted him um, clemency to get out. Pollard? Yeah, Jonathan Pollard. Yeah, John. Can be there you go. It has to be very, efficient. very, very, and and with all the recent data leakages that we have, they've got a very good picture of all of us. And with Facebook, if you had Facebook, who sweet that was. You know, add Facebook to your Equifax. We got some really good information. We got everything on you. And then you add my OPM data to it, which I don't have Facebook, but I had the other two. I mean, it, it, was, it was Taj Mahal data. It was awesome. <laughs> you know? Is it even that difficult, though? I mean, we give China our plans on how to build everything so they can make it for us. Are they really stealing all this stuff? I mean, we're giving them. Well, we're not giving what they want. <laughs> I, I'm giving you the, you know, to make a piece of clothing when I want the ability to make a prosthetic limb that costs a million dollars. Well, on a side note, this has nothing to do with espionage. Did you ever see an article that said we were going to send our, ch our chicken to China to be processed and have it sent back? Where was the efficiency in that? I don't, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. It, but, <laughs> I mean, how are you going to get it over there and you're going to process it to send it back for consumption? Thank you. And I didn't drip.